All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob. And if you talk to anybody out there who has been reading DC comics for, well, really since the nineties, and you ask them, what would you say the top five comic book stories are from DC comics? I guarantee you somewhere in that list will be Kingdom Come. And rightfully so. Kingdom Come is one of the greatest stories ever written by DC comics, right? It's written by Mark Wade and it's drawn by Alex Ross. For those of you guys who are curious about the artist, Alex Ross is kind of like the premier comic book artist the definitive guy doesn't really draw comics as much as he used to this guy is where it was at and this story is kind of like the definitive dc story for a variety of reasons so the reason we're covering this is one i'm going to be on a cruise for the next week and a half or so and two because we're covering uh, dark crisis infinite frontier and this is one of the worlds they landed on and instead of just kind of giving you guys some sort of ad hoc explanation i figured we would actually remaster the kingdom come series we did before and bring it to you here so you could basically see what this story is about and why it's such a big deal they landed here so the way the kingdom come opens up is it's really kind of given to us by a quote now while this story does deal with like what is essentially a superhero or a superhuman civil war in dc comics really more of like a civil war event before marvel civil war it's also just as much a religious story it's not really on the nose or anything like that like the god of abraham will save us but it's one of those things where there's a lot of religious underpinnings and kind of like armageddon-esque scenarios and and really just kind of an overall feel that goes with it so what we get here is we're told and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood there fell a great star from the heaven burning as if it were a lamp and i beheld and heard an angel saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth and what you end up getting here is this kind of moment where you basically have norman mckay who is reading from the book of revelation to wesley dodds now this moment here is highly important and it's really the most significant if you understand the history of Wesley Dodd. So in DC Comics, way back in the 1980s, well, technically 1989, so really like the late 1980s, with Sandman Volume 2, Issue Number 1, we were introduced to a character that you've all probably heard of called Dream of the Endless. And the way this worked is that there came a point in time where in the DC continuity itself, back in the 1930s, Dream of the Endless had basically been trapped on Earth, right? Literally had his crystal taken away from him and all kinds of stuff. But regardless, he was stuck on Earth. And the result was that it retained havoc across the earth itself in the sense that if if dream of the endless is captured people can't dream properly their sleep doesn't work the way it's supposed to so what you had were all these people across the world that were experiencing bouts of insomnia or they were just sleeping continually or they were having like waking dreams or basically they were awake but they weren't really there they were just dreaming all the time wesley dodds is one of those guys the big difference here is that wesley dodds had a lot of prophetic dreams so he was essentially dreaming of the future different things along those lines what came Kingdom Come does, and what's so cool about this, is this story was written back before you had the New 52. And what that means is this takes place during what was called New Earth, basically the continuity that came after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earth. So there's only one universe here. And the reason why that matters is because when it came to New Earth and guys like Wesley Dodds, while he did technically get a new origin, a lot of it was pretty intact with the way he existed way back before the events of Crisis on Infinite Earth. And the way this story is told, it really kind of harkens back to the heroes of yesterday year so while technically this is post-crisis in a lot of ways it feels like they're referencing the age of superheroes from the golden age of comics from the 1940s and dc's publishing history it's one of the reasons why i love it so much right because alex ross art always remind me of an era or a time when superheroes stood a little bit taller and walked a little more confidently and there was no ambiguity determining the difference between the good guys and the bad guys the good guys fought the bad guys and the day was saved and that was it there was no such thing as anti-heroes or anything like that the waters weren't murky but the reality here is that wesley dodds even growing into his old age had seemingly never lost the power of dream of the endless and so what that means is that what he's experiencing right now are these visions and he even tells norman mckay seven thunders will utter their voices and it was given unto him to make war with the saints babylon falls norman be the one who listens to me and this is why it's important is because the way this is presented to us is that wesley dodds is considered to be a kook he's considered to be a crazy person right these visions of the end times and the apocalypse coming and everything's going to die and come to an end right all that kind of stuff nobody really takes him seriously and he can't convince anybody that he, these dreams that he's having are legitimate dreams and even in the old sandman stories right the old wesley dodd comics 
that in a lot of ways, it was kind of the question, is this guy really insane? But right? you really saw DC sort of toying with the idea that maybe he really was crazy. And so it was really cool because in order to basically calm him down, right, in order to calm him down and to keep him or get him back to a normal state, he tells Norman McKay, you have to read, right? You have to read from the book. Now, eventually Wesley Dodds passes on. And this is when Norman McKay basically gives us a kind of tour of what the world looks like. And we learn things like the United Nations has enacted more metahuman censures. And there's a reason why metahumans are censured, which basically means their, their ability to act publicly or speak or what have you is curtailed. Not necessarily in the sense that anything's actually being done, right? These are toothless measures that are happening. But what Norman tells us here is he says that he and Wesley Dodds and, and his wife, you know, Norman's wife, that they were all friends at one point and Wesley would come over and they would talk and, and different things along those lines. But he says before the bitterness overcame him, Wesley and I would walk, right? We would pick our way through the city. For hours, he'd bemoan the passing of things like Olympic Games and Nobel Prizes. Sometimes he'd ambush complete strangers and ask them how much they missed of the concept of human achievement. And he says, I don't know what surprised me more, the oddity of the question or the growing number of people who seemed to know what he was talking about. I tried to defuse him. I would joke that he was just some old guy unable to appreciate this new generation, but he would never laugh that Wesley insisted that human initiative began to erode the day people asked a new breed to face their future for them. Essentially, the first time heroes began to crop up and the first time humanity looked at heroes to save them instead of humanity saving themselves. And he says he mocked their worth, these newcomers, and spoke instead of legends gone, of costume champions who had, in his day, inspired human achievement, not belittled it. He swore he'd never forget the world they came from. He wanted them to be remembered. And that's when you have Norman McKay, who goes into Planet Krypton, which is obviously a play on Planet Hollywood. And when he's in there, it's basically this entire restaurant modeled after the superheroes of yesteryear. Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, The Flash, these different guys, Batman, Superman, and so on, that the idea of superheroes has become a, almost a kind of thing that's a, a joke, right? It's almost a, a, a kind of commercialized concept that instead of Wonder Woman standing for righteousness and paving the way for women to progress. Instead of Superman representing everything humanity can become, instead of Batman representing what it means to be a dick, uh, what you have is all these different characters who basically represent nonsense, right? They represent commercialization and they represent the loss of what it means for society in terms of humans actually being something that's worth a damn. And so what happens is he says the Sandman had gone to his grave without one grain of faith in the future. And the saddest part was he was far from alone. With each passing day, hope for tomorrow has become more and more precious a commodity among everyday folk. Still, I tried to keep the faith and hew to the scriptures. According to the word of God, the meek would someday inherit the earth, but God never accounted for the mighty. Now, this is where we get the reality of how things had shifted. Now, we'll find out later on in terms of what had actually taken place that had led to this shift. But what he says here is that the world that Wesley Dodds had left behind was not the world that he remembered. You know, Wesley Dodds, the Sandman, was from the world of Superman and Wonder Woman and Green Lantern, the Flash, these heroes that represented everything humanity was, was striving to be. That we as human beings are fallible and, and we usually screw up more than we do things right. Not because we're somehow incompetent or inept, we are in a lot of ways, but only because we as human beings don't learn until we fail. If we could somehow know what the end result of our cons or of our actions were going to be, what those consequences would be, we would never make mistakes. But it's only by making mistakes that we get better. And we look back on the consequences of those choices that we truly begin to realize what it is we lost or gained or anything along those lines. And that what had happened here is somewhere along the line, the traditional superheroes of old with DC Comics, Superman, Flash, and all those guys, they're out of the picture. And instead, they're now replaced by all these different heroes, all these different superpowered beings that exist out there. But what Norman says is, I tell myself that this too shall pass, that humans still have a chance to reclaim a world rightfully theirs while it still exists. This is the face of superhuman might and superhuman odds. Time has not yet run out for humanity. And so the reality here is that when it comes to all these superpower beings out there, where initially they seem to rise up and replace these various superheroes that we're the most familiar with, which of course, again, we'll get back to them, but one, you know, as these, these characters rose up, 
instead of them becoming a new breed of superhero that could basically help the world and make it a better place that could somehow lead them into a, a greener pasture instead of doing that now these descendants of superman and wonder woman and all these guys right these next generation of superheroes even if they're not the biological children of uh, of superman and all those different guys that now they just fight for the sake of fighting right they just face off against each other for the sake of facing off against each other there's no rum or reason here there's no greater cause being served by all this it's just people fighting for the sake of fighting and there's a lot of innocent people who get caught in the collateral damage now one of the things that we'll find over the course of kingdom come is that humanity actually brought it on itself that this whole situation that you're seeing here is a perfect example of be careful what you ask for you just might get it because humanity did this to itself and again that's kind of the nature of what mark wade says here is that we as people don't learn our lessons until we screw up but amidst all this fighting that's taking place here suddenly in Times Square, there's a journalist that comes on from the Daily Planet. You may be wondering why it's not Lois Lane. You'll find out. <laughs> but basically she says like a catastrophic event has happened in Kansas. And so before we find out what that is, we actually end up following Norman McKay once he returns to his church. And the reality here is the role he plays as, as the head of the church, right, with his congregation is to instill hope in people whose hope is barely hanging on by a threat. Right, wrong, or otherwise, regardless of how you see religion in a lot of ways it really is just a concept of hope that's really all it is a construct for hope how much faith people put in what they're hearing and how much conviction they tie to what they believe it really just shifts from one person to the next but religion as a whole is really nothing more than just a hope construct that some people latch on to for the idea of finding a better tomorrow or making sense out of the world in which they live but norman mckay cannot provide his congregation with the hope that they're looking for all these individuals who have grown up in a time before all these new superheroes rose up and just started going crazy, they remember what the world was like. And they're looking to Norman McKay to help guide them back to remembering what that world was and that this won't all be this way. But Norman McKay has a hard time being hopeful. And in fact, he tells him, I can't do this. I'm sorry, I can't lie to you. I can't fill you with hope when I don't even have hope myself. And so his congregation, of course, basically ends up leaving. They don't so much abandon him, but they do feel a bit of trepidation, a trepidation and shame as they look at him and they see a man who has seemingly lost the faith. So how could a man with no faith possibly lead people who are in need of faith? And that's when a significantly important thing happens in the life of Norman McKay when he's visited by the Spectre. Now, this is probably the part that you're waiting for. For a lot of you guys out there who had never read Kingdom Come, yes, the beginning of the story seems to have nothing to do with DC or any of the heroes we know. It takes a little bit to kind of get to that point, but it all begins to make sense. And so when the Spectre shows up here and basically tells tells Norman McKay, I need your aid here, the Spectre basically ends up revealing to Norman McKay what his purpose is. Not fully, but basically giving him an idea and simply saying, I have been sent here by a higher power in order to judge the world. Now, here's the thing about this, right? That when it comes to the Spectre, back when he initially came into existence, he operated independently. One of the things that DC did in order to both make the Spectre more grounded, as well as potentially give him a weakness, as well as have him essentially have a greater involvement in the DC landscape, was basically bond him to people. And that by bonding the Spectre to individuals, it was a way to almost turn the Spectre from this ethereal, you know, godly imbued being to what was basically a superhero. It was kind of like that in the beginning, but the, the way the Spectre initially appeared back in the old school, all American comics basically began to move away and it began to shift. So by the time you got to the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, he was just this wildly powerful ethereal force that would just show up every once in a while. And while it was kind of cool, DC was wanting to bring him back to the world of being a superhero and so that's one of the ways in which they did that plus it was cool to have a person who was basically the embodiment of god's wrath walking around the world and so what ends up happening is the specter basically tells norman mckay you have been imbued with a portion of the power that wesley dodds had but more so than that you are going to be my eyes and ears here on earth and where norman mckay is just kind of like why in the world like what what how could I possibly be suited to fit this? And even himself doesn't fully seem to comprehend everything that's going on. One of the things he says is explain this to me, right? If you are truly a being of great power, how is it that you can find no way to avert this catastrophe that you say is coming, this Armageddon that you say is going to take place? And the response of the Spectre is, that is not my task. Once Earth boasted other saviors who might have stemmed the tide of destruction, but as you will see, they are no longer the solution they are in many ways the problem. And so what the Spectre does is he brings Norman McKay on a journey to show him 
all these different individuals who are the superheroes of yesterday. What happened to Batman? What happened to Superman? What happened to Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, those guys? And so what we find out here is he's taken to Superman basically on a farm. And that as Superman goes around here, of course, Wesley Dodds whispers and whatnot. And the response to the Spectre is, no, 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 you're good. They, yeah, he can't hear you, right? He can't see or hear you. I have shielded you from this. Uh, I am that powerful, right? That not even the man of steel who can hear virtually anything can hear you here. Superman is effectively met by the arrival of Wonder Woman. And the cool thing is that Wonder Woman, uh, the way she speaks here, is she simply says, or at least uh, you know, communicates that she's been coming here relatively frequently. Now, one of the things that I do want to establish here is that Superman does not respond to the name Clark. I mean, he does, but he responds with disdain, right? That's not my name. So when Wonder Woman refers to him as Clark, she corrects herself, then refers to him as Cal. And that's when he starts talking to her, right? He was like, you know, I haven't seen you in months. What brings you to the farm? And this is what's really interesting here is she says the vain hope that you're still not here and superman says these are my roots right to which she responds you can't live forever in solitude that what superman has done here is basically cut himself off from the rest of humanity isolated himself in his entirety from everybody else and what he says is things can grow here right this place that i'm in life can really grow and flourish here and that's when wonder woman responds but it's all a farce and when she touches the wall and basically reveals he's in the fortress of solitude that he's not actually out there in the world living it really is superman living a lie right you know she's she literally chimes in and she says listen to me like you have to do something right like i've come with news from the outside and it's bad news that news has a, that has an effect shaking the world that he's out of control and that's when superman says i tried to tell them that 10 years ago i tried to tell them they backed the wrong horse that they should not have gone along with that guy but they did. And of course, as a result of that, by removing himself from humanity, what Superman's doing is effectively saying, I could save you, but I'm not going to. You chose this path, now you have to live with it. And humanity's been regretting it every single day. And in fact, Wonder Woman picks up on that and she says, and they don't listen, I know, stop punishing them. And the response to Superman is, I don't care, right? They deserve whatever fate they got. They brought it on themselves. I feel nothing for them. I have no desire to help them at all. And she says, okay, fine. If that's true, right? If, if that's really the case, then come with me and let me show you the world as it exists right now. Let me show you the outside world because you've been hiding from it. You've been ignoring it. You've been pretending like it doesn't exist. You cut yourself off from it. Just go and watch and see what's become of the world, but steal yourself right? Be prepared for what it is that happens. And so he ultimately walks into his area with the viewing screens and he simply just says on. And that's when we end up finding out there's just a colossal event that's taking place. That what had happened is the, the villain uh, parasite had basically been chased down by the by Magog as well as his, at least what's referred to as the Justice Battalion. Now, Magog, of course, was the character that you saw in uh, Infinite Frontier. And we'll talk more about him as the story unfolds because he turns out to be hugely important. But it was a massive fight between parasites and all these different guys. And Parasite was literally just trying to flee, right? It was one of these things where he was begging for his life. He was begging for, begging to be saved. He tried to surrender. They wouldn't let him surrender. They quite literally just wanted to kill him. And so in an act of desperation, what Parasite had done is he had torn Captain Adam in half, or at least split him. And when that happened, it basically set off a massive explosion. And what we're told is that early reports indicate immediate casualties numbering close to a million. As the dying Adam's radioactive energy swept hundreds of kilometers, rendering the entire state of Kansas, as well as part of Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri, an irradiated wasteland. Though Magog's comrades have since prevented further spread of the nuclear blight, the total loss of America's breadbasket, the sterilization of its agrarian culture, has thrown the world economy into near collapse in the face of global famine. That's what we're looking at here. Quite literally, the entirety of the American agricultural industry has just been annihilated by the force of Magog and the recklessness that came with just attacking the attacking Parasite in that way. And so the response of Superman, even after having seen all that, is there's nothing I can do from here. Go back to your island, Diana. You're safe there. And walks away, right? And literally just kind of like, that's it. There's nothing I can do. And so, uh, you know, in that instance, the response of Wonder Woman is, we won't all sit here and wait. Like, we 
we won't all deal with this, right? We're not all going to sit here and rest on our laurels. And that's when Norma McKay asked the Spectre, neither will the rest of us, who is she talking about? And the Spectre takes him on a tour of a few others and says that the, the idea of Superman abandoning his role as a superhero had a huge effect on the entire superhero landscape that some, some heroes out there were so disheartened because they took their lead from Superman, they were so disheartened by seeing him so demoralized that when he quit, they quit. That there were others out there who basically started functioning in a way to where they keep their city safe, but nobody ever sees them. A really good example of this is The Flash, right? The Flash just races around the entirety of Keystone City, keeping it safe, keeping it protected, but nobody ever sees him. Nobody ever knows he's there. That you have Hawkman, who basically operates out in the Pacific Northwest as kind of an environmental protector. That you have uh, the Green Lantern, who quite literally made an emerald citadel for himself that orbits the Earth. He's the, the only occupant there, and he spends all of his days watching for an extraterrestrial threat that will seemingly never come. That all these different people out there, all these members of the superhero community in their own ways, effectively did the exact same thing Superman did to a degree. Now, of course, you end up having Norman McKay who says, but what happened to Batman? What happened to Gotham City? And what it looks like here is that in the city of Gotham, one, Batman's got an entirely automated system that runs, and two, no crime is tolerated in any capacity whatsoever. None, right? Batman has actually become far more extreme than he was when Superman existed because Superman represented hope. And even if Batman didn't necessarily put that perception on, it permeated him, right? The hope he experienced with Superman was the hope that Gotham City could truly become a better place. And the only thing we get here is the Spectre telling Norman McKay, Batman has a city under control. And so what happens is you have Norman McKay who is taken to a bridge. And this is probably one of the single greatest moments in the entirety of Kingdom Come. He asks him the question like, that's all, that's what you wanted to show me. And the Spectre asks, does that disturb you? And the response of, of Norman is yes, right? You're an angel. That makes you a messenger of hope. A greater power sent you. Your very existence is a testament to faith. You mean that all you have to tell me is that those who could save us simply won't? And that's the thing that Norman McKay can't quite grasp his head around is they could save us. It's not like they were killed. They didn't die in action. They just won't. They simply just won't save us. And I don't understand why. Why are we as humanity simply not worth saving? And so that's when Norman McKay has to come to grips with the fact humanity did it to itself. And so in this moment, when you're on this bridge, you end up having all these, these, you know, heroes, like a great big fight breaks out here. Pandemonium starts reigning supreme. You got the heroes against villains, if you could call them that. And as usual, people are caught in the crossfire. It's just absolute pandemonium. And in fact, what has happened is that in the aftermath of Kansas, that because of the lengths that Magog and his forces went to in order to take out a uh, parasite, that now it kind of feels like all bets are off, right? That whenever it comes to this bar of recklessness and lack of concern for collateral damage, every time it gets raised by Magog, everybody else follows suit. So in a lot of ways, he's kind of the opposite of Superman, right? His antithesis. And so it's really kind of crazy how this, how this goes on. And so what you end up getting is in the midst of all this, right? You literally have people who were stuck in a cable car about to fall to their death, right? It's virtually the end of these guys. And you have this thing where it's like, can anybody get out here, right? Norman McKay the whole time is like, don't you understand, right? Talking to the Spectre, if any of us are to survive, any of us now more than ever, we need hope. And then he says, and suddenly there was a wind, right? Not a, not really a wind, a blur of motion, bending the steel of their weapons and changing the very course of the mighty river below. He says, even before the bystanders freed themselves from the cable car, they knew we all did. We knew and we remembered. And somebody says, look, somebody else says up in the sky and it's Superman who's finally returned. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments section. If you guys want me to finish this, I feel like you guys are going to be like, yes, <laughs> because Kingdom Come is just one of the absolute greatest stories ever in the history of DC Comics, right? It's so cool because you get this little moment here, right? This little, this little kind of a, kind of a small moment. And when, when Norman McKay basically says, Superman had not turned his back on us, right? He stands in the sky, faith rewarded, he is returned. And dear God, the threat of Armageddon hasn't ended. It's simply just begun.
All right, what's going on, guys? This is Rob, and we are back with Kingdom Come Part 2. Yes, we are, Part Dos. Now, here's the thing. Superman and the Justice League, as we know them, have effectively returned, right? Superman, Wonder Woman, Hawkman, all these different characters, they've all basically returned back to the landscape. So, what we're looking at now is a scenario where the superheroes of old have returned to face the superheroes of new. Now, this is where things get really, really interesting, because on the surface, we would look at that and we would say, okay, so like the day saved and everything's going to be sorted out we're pretty far from that actually and things are going to get a lot worse before they get better so what this does is it initially picks up at the statue of liberty and you've basically got this crazy guy right like the american commando and his minutemen is what he calls him now the thing about this here is he just kind of goes on this just ultra i wouldn't even call it patriotic so much as just ultra insane rant where he says like this is my country right for years the american commando and the minutemen have protected the u.s from foreign threats only to have overlooked the most insidious menace of all the poor tired huddled masses camping on our shores begging for citizenship you immigrants dare expect sanctuary america's not as big as it used to be for god's sakes kansas is gone we can't house you now we can't even feed you now but still you force yourselves on us well no more today the america mando declares war on the wretched refuse and at that point you basically have all these guys who start attacking these people People who were looking to make their way into the United States. Now, while all that goes on, what you have is another of these really just anti-hero groups out there that just attacks the American Mandos. And again, as we talked about before, what you have here in this instance are basically feral superheroes. It's the best way to look at it. That traditionally in DC Comics, the emergence of Superman, while he didn't really present himself as the de facto leader in the standard by which all superheroes should follow, it just kind of ended up that way. The Superman's morale was almost unquestionable and incorruptible. What you have here are basically people with powers and no leadership whatsoever, right? It's an answer to the question, what will people do in a circumstance when there is no one to lead them? They'll do whatever it is that they want to do. And the, the rules or any collateral damage won't really make any difference. It's a really, really interesting critique on people who are like, we should not have an ordered government. Okay, well, if you look at the nature of humanity, what is the average person without someone telling them what to do or where to go. They're people who just do things arbitrarily and never take into account the wants or desires or the consequences of their actions on other people. It just becomes lawlessness and it'll only lead to chaos and destruction. And so it's really, really interesting how this is critiqued, how that concept is looked at and put through the lens of these superheroes. Because what you get is in the middle of all this, you have the Justice League that arrives here. Now, contrary to, to what you might think in the sense of Superman and them just show up and start pummeling everybody, while they do bring an end to this fight, what Superman does is he basically presents himself and the Justice League to these people and basically gives them an option, right? You can join us or you can be dealt with. Now, there is a way in which they're dealt with and that way doesn't necessarily come until, well, really towards, you know, in this story. But it's one of those things where Superman's hand is kind of forced. Instead, what he does is he kind of repairs the Statue of Liberty as best he can, kind of presenting himself as a beacon of hope. And then in turn, basically uses the numbers of all these vigilantes and brings them to his side. Now, that's an important distinction that I want to make here. When it comes to these different heroes out here, again, they're not really villains. They're more just feral. Like, they've never really had any direction. They've never been taught any better. One of the things to know, and what's kind of interesting, is this book in a lot of ways throws into sharp relief the idea of, like, social constructs, different things like that. Like, if you scale out, right, if you look at, like, how people function on a day-to-day -day life or look at your life, and then you scale out and look at it at a macro scale, we as human beings largely just do things because that's just what you're supposed to do. We don't question it. We don't really ask why. We just do it because everybody else does that social norms and social constructs are largely just created in order to provide a sense of comfort and that anybody who deviates outside of these unspoken social norms has to be quote unquote corrected and brought back in again even if what we're doing is entirely stupid and ridiculous and doesn't really make any sense a really good example of this is the Mitch Hedberg joke, right? That like escalators that are broken are basically just stairs. So why would you be an idiot and take stairs instead of taking the escalator, right? But we don't think about that. We're just like, oh, the escalator's not working. I'll take the stairs instead, even though that's basically stairs. <laughs> and we all do that. And so that's why it's kind of interesting when 
somebody just sort of looks up and says, why am I doing this, right? Because the response of everybody around them is shut up, stop asking questions, get your head back down. And then they just continue on just like they did before, right? So, you know, violating social norms is kind of looked down upon, which really kind of makes you beg the question, who's the one that, that really is screwed up here? Is it the one who's asking the question, why am I following these social norms? Or is it the one who's telling that person to stop asking questions and to follow those social norms? But the thing about this is that these heroes don't have a leader. There's no one out there for, you know, to, to really tell them, here is how heroes are supposed to act. They're feral. And so Superman presenting himself in this way is quite literally giving these people the kind of, you know, person to follow or the kind of ideology to a degree. Now you're going to find over the course of this that there is a lot of hypocrisy that goes on there and a lot of things that don't necessarily seem to make sense. But following all of that, Superman and his guys, you know, the Justice League appear basically before the United Nations at a kind of press conference. And they say, look, like we've been gone for a really long time, right? A lot of you, or at least some of you all may remember who we are. Some of you may not. But the fact that we've been gone, that's our mistake. And he says, in our absence, a new breed of metahumans has arisen, a vast phalanx of self-styled heroes unwilling to preserve life or defend the defenseless, a legion of vigilantes who have perverted their great powers, who have forsworn the responsibilities due to them. We have returned to teach them the meaning of truth and justice. Together, we will guide this new breed with wisdom and if necessary, with force. Above all, we will restore order. We will make things right again. Now, there is an attempt by various members of the press to ask some questions, but for the most part, they're not necessarily answered. There is a point when Superman is asked, well, what if this leads to you having to face Magog? To which Superman just kind of looks away and seems to avoid the question, and then basically just ends up taking off. Now, one of the things that we are kind of given here, and, and at least, you know, we're given this kind of moment where Superman transitions to Wayne Manor. Of course, we knew it was only going to be a matter of time before he would confront Bruce Wayne. And this interaction between the two is really, really cool because when Superman gets there, Wayne Manor's trashed. I mean, this place is just torn up. I mean, obviously it's just experienced some pretty rough times and Superman finds Batman down in the cave. But one of the things to notice here is that there is no happiness from Batman to see Superman. And in fact, this exchange is phenomenal because what you have here is Superman who says, uh, Batman, I know you're here, right? Like you cannot hide from me. And the response of Batman is, I bow to your superior wisdom. After all, you know all about hiding don't you, Clark? And it's one of those things where Batman holds a lot of animosity towards Superman. Now, what's interesting here is that the debate between the two is that Superman has always believed that mankind should be led to a better future, right? If the world becomes a better place, it's because Superman and the actions of the superheroes show humanity that they can become better. But you could argue that's a very naive perspective, right? That Superman is John Turturro from Miller's Crossing, right? When you have Gabriel Byrne with a gun pointed at his head and, and Superman says, look into your heart, right? That's what he is. Whereas Batman is the realist, right? Batman looks at humanity and says, no, if given the opportunity, humanity will just do crazy and violent things. I mean, look at these vigilantes that exist out there. They're an answer to your question, Superman. What is humanity at its core? What will humanity become when you take away consequences? It's the grocery carts litmus test. For those of you guys who are unfamiliar with that, the grocery cart litmus test is this really, really fascinating ideology. What it says is that when you go to the grocery store and you buy your groceries and you put them in the cart and then you put them in the car and so on and so forth and then you're done, the grocery cart is sitting right there and that's when the test comes into play, right? There's no reward for putting the grocery cart back inside the cart corral, if that's what it's called. I don't know what it's actually called, but there's a, there's no reward for doing that, but it is the right thing to do. However, if you don't do that and you just leave the grocery cart out there in the middle of the parking lot, there's no punishment for that. So what will a person do when there's no reward for doing the right thing, but no punishment for doing the wrong thing? What, what will they end up doing here? And the argument that Batman's making here, albeit absent the grocery cart litmus test, although I would love to have seen that in the comic, <laughs> is he says, the world in which you see Clark is the answer to that question question. The world that you see out there, that's what it looks like. When you have metahumans where there's no consequences for doing the wrong thing, but no benefit for doing the right thing outside of a, you know, moral pat on the back, they'll do whatever they want to do. And that right and wrong won't matter anymore. Right and wrong are completely and totally irrelevant. There's just simply what a man can do and what a man can't do. And that's it. That, those are the only rules that apply here. So you championing how great humanity can become. The evidence runs contrary to everything that you believe. And that's why Batman 
man had basically turned Gotham City into what's essentially a dictatorship, right? where he rules it with an iron fist. Now, there's a few different reasons why this had happened. The first one is because once Batman's identity became publicly known, Bane and Two-Face showed up and just wrecked Wayne Manor. Now, of course, they weren't able to access the Batcave, hence the reason why all this stuff is still intact. The other reason why is because there came a point uh, where essentially Arkham Asylum was just annihilated, and basically all the villains that were in it were basically killed. So there's very few of any of Batman's traditional villains left, if any at all. Instead, now it's all just sort of metahumans that are there. The metahumans, those ones that just kind of do whatever it is that they want, presumably dealt with Batman's villains. But the reality is that in the absence of all that, the Gotham City in the eyes of Bruce Wayne is a utopia. There is no crime, none of that stuff. Now, people don't necessarily have the same free will that they had before, but as we've seen so far with regards to all these metahumans, what will people do with complete and total freedom? They'll go crazy, right? They'll basically destroy things that, that right and wrong simply won't matter. It's just, it's a really, really interesting idea here. And I love the way that this is put together. And so that's where you have just kind of a splitting of ideologies here. That at the end of the day, there is no real way to find any measure of unification. And in fact, Batman even goes as far as to tell Superman, you are just as naive as you ever were. Like you really believe that humanity is this great thing, but rest assured, right? Like there, there's myself and the people I work with whose names you will never know. We see humanity for what it really is. And what you see here in Gotham City, we will try to extend this to the rest of the world because humanity by its very nature needs to be controlled. If there's no one telling people where to go or what to do, then people will be lost. They'll be just chaotic and nonsensical, right? They'll do things that are quite literally worse for society because whether or not something's better for society won't matter to them. They'll operate on their own selfish instincts. The world has shown us that. Humanity has shown us that. So we have to control them because they, they cannot control themselves. Now, initially, Superman ends up leaving. Instead of just creating a confrontation with Batman, he basically walks away. And you end up finding out that the various people that Bruce Wayne has on his side include people like Ted Cord and Dinah Lance and Oliver Queen, that these are some pretty intelligent and capable forces that are out there. More so than that, what Batman also says is, with the Justice League returned and the Justice League reforming, what Superman's going to do is all those different metahumans out there who are just rogue and doing their own thing. It's only going to be a matter of time before they basically join his ranks, which means the, the ranks of the Justice League are going to bolster, which means we have to find our own team. We have to build our own team up. This includes people like, like Black Adam. It includes people like Dr. Fate and so on and so forth. We've got to build our own team. And so what you end up getting is this moment where as time goes on, you have Superman who is meeting with different groups out there, right? These, these metahumans and whatnot who are just rampaging and causing all kinds of problems and whatnot and basically teaching them direction. Now, not all of them join the side of Superman and we're not really given an immediate answer as to what it is that happens to them. Instead, for the most part, the ones who do agree with Superman basically join his side. But what we end up doing is transitioning to another group out there, which is basically called the uh, Mankind Liberation Front. And what this is, is a coming together of humans across the world. Now, one of the funny things here is despite its name, not all of them are directly tied to humanity. I mean, they are, but they also kind of have, they have powers essentially. So you could argue metahumans. And the reason why I say this is because one of the first people that we're met with is Vandal Savage. Now, depending on how you want to look at DC's history, you could take that traditional history of Vandal Savage as it exists regarding Dionysium and the substance he consumed that basically made him immortal. You can apply that to Kingdom Come if you want to and say in this alternate reality, that's basically how he came to be. Of course, that whole Dionysium thing was established in the New 52 Batman run by Scott Snyder. Uh, Vandal Savage is not just a guy who's going to live for like probably 85 to 90 years and then die of age, he's immortal. But regardless, this, this Mankind Liberation Front is headed up by Lex Luthor, and you have a few different people here, one of whom is Al Zufash, who's basically the successor to Raj Al Ghul. Then you also have, of course, Lord Naga, you've got Selina Kyle, you've got the Riddler, Edward Nigma. And the cool thing is that what you find is that behind the scenes with a lot of things that's going on, the, uh, the Mankind Liberation Front is actually working to make life more difficult for humanity. And I know it seems counterintuitive that they're doing things like impeding rescue efforts, right? Or they're getting the, getting in the way of uh, food and resources that are being brought to the United States from different places and so on. And so when the question is being asked, how is any of this helping humanity, which is the charter under which you operate, the response of Lex Luthor is simply no pain, no gain. He says, our objective is to heighten the tension between humans and metahumans, to bring it to a head so that humans have no choice but to reclaim the being of world power, regardless of the cost. There will be war, bloodshed, but in the end, 
mankind will once again rule the earth. Now, the reason why he says that, of course, obviously he wants it to be him and this council that rules everything, but the reason why he makes this argument is because for years, what has happened is humanity has handed the reins over to superheroes to keep them protected. That's the way it was when you initially had the Justice League. It's the way it was when the Justice League disbanded and we got this new generation of heroes. Humanity ultimately bit off more than they could chew. They regretted the decision they made, but there was no one willing to step up and save humanity from itself. Now that the Justice League has returned, humanity hasn't changed. It's not doing anything different than it was before. It's not like the reformation of the, of the Justice League led to humanity saying, oh my God, I see the light. We clearly made a mistake by looking at superheroes and asking them to save us. No, it was humanity looking at the Justice League and saying, man, the world's such a terrible place. Save us, Justice League. Show us a better way. And then when humanity made the decision that it made, which is what we'll talk about later on in the story, the Justice League disbanded. And the anti-heroes that rose up, humanity was like, yes, you're the ones we want. And then when the anti-heroes did exactly what they would do, which was showing really in a lot of ways, becoming a mirror for humanity itself, that humans were just like, no, we don't want this. This is not what we wanted. We want we want the Justice League back. So the Justice League came back and they're like, Justice League, these metahumans are going crazy. You have to save us. So it's one of those things where humanity never quite takes responsibility for itself. It never looks around at any point and says, maybe I'm the one responsible for all of this. Instead, it just blames everything else on everybody else. And so the idea of the Mankind Liberation Front is to force the hand of humanity to make things so dire that what the majority of the human race does, right? What people in general do is they look at metahumans and say, metahumans in their entirety are the problem. Metahumans are the reason why all of this is the way it is. We have to get metahumans, we have to get rid of them completely. And then once that's done, that will lead to humanity re-inheriting the earth, quote unquote, as Lex Luthor puts it. Now, the other part of this is that Lex does have an ace up his sleeve. It's one thing to interrupt trade routes and to make resources more scarce. It's another to actually be able to stand against Superman and the Justice League. What we end up finding out here is the ace in the hole that Lex Luthor has is actually Shazam. But before we figure that out, <laughs> before we find out about that, what we end up doing here is basically picking up with a, with a point where Superman and Wonder Woman go to visit Aquaman. Now, initially they ask Aquaman for aid, but the reality here is Aquaman's like, no, like I'm not, I'm not helping you guys at all. One, I never really wanted to be Aquaman. I never wanted to be your Aquaman. I was there more or less because I wanted to ensure Atlantis was protected and because I didn't even really initially know what you guys were about, right? So in a lot of ways, for those of you guys coming from Marvel, it was when Black Panther initially joined the Avengers, he joined them to keep an eye on them, not because he actually wanted to be a part of the team and because he believed in their cause. As time went on, Aquaman did to a degree, but the reality here is that when the time came when it was obvious that Justice League wasn't going going to reform, Superman was done, he had walked away, and there would be no one there to look out for Atlantis, then Aquaman's response was, I'm going to look after my kingdom myself. Whatever happens in the service world, I don't care, so long as it doesn't impede here. Now, this is in reality, and it's one of the things that Wonder Woman points out, it really is Aquaman sticking his head in the sand, and just waiting for the danger to pass, or hoping the danger passes. The question she has is, how long do you think this chaos on the surface will take before it comes down here to the oceans? And the response of Aquaman is, well, if that time comes and I will deal with it then, but that's if that time comes. At the moment, I don't really care. It's not my concern here. And so it's a pretty significant moment because one of the things that we learn is that Wonder Woman had basically been banished from Themyscira. She's not allowed back anymore, that she's lost her title of princess. That the reality here is that with Themyscira, you know, when she had left that place and gone out into the world, she was supposed to be an ambassador and she was supposed to make the world a better place, but she never did. She's not welcome back anymore. And so she has, she's no longer the, the person that we knew. But one of the other things that goes on is you have this uh, this moment where Superman actually finally tracks down, or really it's more like Speedy, he finally tracks down uh, Magog, and then he actually travels to meet him. Now, in a lot of ways, it's one of these things that's fearful, because what this does is it tells us how things got this bad, why the Justice League disbanded, why Superman basically quit the whole nine yards. That what Magog is doing is he's actually out in Kansas, seemingly trying to rebuild to a degree. And that's when Superman asks, like, what are you doing? out here. And you kind of have this moment where Magog basically kind of pokes fun at him, right? Just sort of rustles his feathers a little bit, gives him a bit of a hard time. Superman's not necessarily having it, but the Mad Dogs was like, don't you remember? Like, you're the one who caused all this, right? Like, you're the reason why things are the way they are. And that's when we end up getting this bit of a flashback. And what we find out is that at some previous point in time, the Joker had shown up to the Daily Planet in Metropolis and massacred everybody. 92 men and Lois Lane 
one woman. And the result of that is that with her being killed along with Jimmy Olsen and everybody else, that the Joker was captured and the Joker was put on trial. But before the trial could, could actually take place, Magog showed up and killed the Joker. And instead of humanity condemning this action and saying that's a problem, humanity cheered the action on. They were like, yes, the Joker had to go. The Joker had to die. And what this did is it led to Superman becoming disheartened by the fact that everybody was okay with it. The Magog was eventually arrested. And then when he was put on trial, he was acquitted. And so it was essentially humanity saying, we're okay with the fact that a metahuman took the law into their own hands and killed a villain. We don't really believe in truth and justice anymore. We believe in doing what it takes to win. Now, the reality is that really is what it takes. That really is the case. There are some people out there that just have to die. The result of this is what you had, or really the, the bigger issue that you had here, is that the Magog wasn't really any measure of a leader himself. He was just a guy out there with power. And so when he killed the Joker and became the kind of face of this new generation of superheroes, and Superman abandoned his role, and the Justice League disbanded as well, it left the stage open for all these metahumans to rise. Now, that's the big difference there. I do champion the idea that there are some people out there where the world would just be better off without them. That as a society, you have to create a, a kind of structure, right? That you can't have this kind of open-ended idea where it's like, everybody can do whatever they want to. That makes them happy, you know? Like, you do have to have a rigid and firm structure on how society functions. Otherwise, you start running into all kinds of problems. And yes, like, Magog killing the Joker, isn't him crossing a line? Sure. But if this was, like, Superman who had done it or something like that, things could potentially turn out different. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, like, but Rob, injustice, so on and so forth. Superman was right in injustice. He was 100% right. Humanity couldn't be trusted to make the world a better place. So Superman had to do it for them. That if Superman didn't step in and do that, humanity would have eventually wiped out the whole world. And is what of what use is freedom to a society that will use that freedom to destroy itself? I would say freedom is useless at that point. And so the, the thing about this is that you have this kind of situation where ultimately the Magog comes clean. I don't know why I keep saying the Magog, but the uh, but Magog, I think it's because I'm used to saying the Mangog from uh from the Thor comics at Marvel. <laughs> but Mad God comes clean. And what's been happening is he has this enormous weight that he carries around because he never wanted this. He never wanted to be the face of some new generation of vigilante that showed up and turned the world into a hellhole. He never wanted to be that. He never wanted the entirety, the entire destruction of Kansas. That's never what he wanted here. And so what, he's, what he tells Superman is, I'm sorry, right? Like, this is all your fault. You were supposed to be better than us. You were supposed to be great. You were supposed to be the one that showed us a better way. You weren't supposed to quit. You were supposed to show me what I was doing wrong. You were supposed to guide us. At a time when the world really actually needed you, you quit. You gave up. And so he says, like, I'm tired of dealing with all these ghosts that haunt me. All these, like a million ghosts. All these people in Kansas that haunt me. Punish me. Lock me away. Kill me. Just make the ghosts go away, right? Make my guilty conscience disappear. And that's when Superman tells Wonder Woman, we are at war. And the reason why this matters is because Wonder Woman, having been a warrior and so on and so forth, the big concern of the Spectre and, the, and Norman McKay is that if anybody was going to push Superman over that edge and send him into a place where he would potentially become a dictator, it would be Wonder Woman. Because when you're a hammer, everything is a nail. And so when you're Wonder Woman and all you live to do is fight and like defeat the enemy, the idea of things like nuance, right? The idea of not everybody is an inherent bad guy and not everybody needs to be treated the same way, that kind of thing goes away. Now, to a degree, that's true. But treating people decently does not mean treating people equitably. That if you are a person who has known nothing but war and conflict, if someone showed up to you with a kind and caring and gentle hand, you would likely see them as being weak because the defining attribute of what makes a person strong is whether they can withstand and, and cope with that war-type environment right? Physical and emotional and mental strength. That's what defines a valuable person. You would see that kind person as being weak. Whereas if you are someone who comes from a kind and gentle place, you would look at somebody who uses overbearing force to get their point across as somebody who's inherently weak because you value strength through kindness and compassion. So again, one of the things that Wonder Woman doesn't really seem to have a good grasp of is the nuance of that. Everything can be treated the same way. So that's going to be an element that's actually going to be very, very important as all of this goes on. 
But one of the things that Superman does here is he actually travels to Apocalypse, which is the realm of Darkseid, to visit with Orion. Now, this is kind of a small little deviation here, right? Kind of a small little thing. It's not a great big huge moment. And in fact, word had reached the ears of Superman that basically Darkseid had been overthrown by his son Orion. And that when that had happened, Orion had seized control of Apocalypse. But when Superman came here asking, how can I as a person, right, this, this individual who's supposed to somehow show these metahumans a better way, what do I do about the ones who don't don't want a better way. And the response of Orion is, that's the issue that I ran into. When I took over Apocalypse and I replaced Darkseid, my thought was that all these people who live on Apocalypse would love the idea of freedom. They would love the idea of being able to live their lives as they see, uh, they saw fit. But what I found is that because that's the, li the only life they ever knew, they don't want a different life than that because it's scary, it's fearful. The idea of change, giving them freedom is something they've never known before. Comfort comes in being a prisoner, right? And so because of that when I gave them that freedom, they rejected it. They rebuked it. They didn't want to have any of that, right? By just literally getting rid of Darkseid and no leader operating here, they put me in his place because they wanted someone to rule them. They wanted someone to conquer them, right? To control them, to tell them where to go and what to do. Because for us as people, and you can kind of argue by extension, the people on Apocalypse, we want to be controlled, right? We want direction. We want to be told where do you go? What do you, you know, where to go, what to do, how to act. We want to say we don't. We like to say, no, I don't I don't want that. I want to have a life where I can make my own choices and do my own thing and live my life as I see fit. But when push comes to shove and it really comes down to it, a lot of people out there who have the opportunity to forge their own path choose not to because it's scary. It's outside of what they're used to. And if being, being given the choice between stepping into that box or staying in the box they're in, they'll choose the box they're in. And that's, the, that's the, the wisdom that Orion offers here. If what they understand is being conquered, if what humanity and these people understand is being made to do things by force, if what they understand is imprisonment and pain, then give them that. Give them what it is that makes them comfortable. And so while it's not necessarily Superman approaching this from the perspective of we're going to make people suffer, what he does is out there in Kansas, this irradiated wasteland, he starts building a prison. He literally starts building together this giant prison system where all those individuals who stand against him will be housed. And so as the final little bit of this video, what we end up doing is switching over to the Mankind Liberation Front where you have Lex Luthor effectively telling everybody they've brought someone on board that will assist essentially help them to change the tide to achieve their goal and effectively eliminate the entire metahuman issue once and for all, allowing humanity to effectively step into the role of being the sole inheritors of the world. And this person is revealed to be Batman, accompanied by Ted Kord and Dinah Lance and Oliver Queen. What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are back with Kingdom Come Part 3. Yes, enter Shazam. So I know this is probably the one that a lot of you guys have been waiting for, um, who were aware of what we did you know, in the, the last video where we talked about how Shazam was a part of it. It was pretty obvious. It's, it's really, really awesome, right? Let's check this out. What we end up getting here, and one of the things to keep in mind is that it's not necessarily the Spectre, and this is something that I, that, that I saw in the comments, it's not necessarily the Spectre that's taking Norman McKay on all these journeys. If anything, it's the visions of Norman McKay that that's leading the Spectre on all of this. Because remember, the Spectre is there to judge some future evil, and he's very cloak and dagger whenever he talks to uh, Norman McKay about exactly what he's there for or what his purpose is. We as the audience are well aware of the Spectre. We're well aware of how dark and twisted he can be, but also how good he can be, just depending on who he's bonded to at that particular point in time or whether his spirit's gone insane. But that's something that we'll actually talk about here in a little while. But at the moment, switching back to Earth, what you get is the completion of this prison that has basically been built by Superman. And oddly enough, it looks like that old Legion of Doom headquarters from the, uh, what is it, the Super Friends, where Aquaman rode around on a seahorse <laughs> and talked to fish. That show did more damage to Aquaman as a character than any meme that's ever been created by humanity. <laughs> <laughs> because of that show, everybody's like, Aquaman rides seahorses and talks to fish, and no one could take him seriously anymore. But the thing about this is that this prison that's being built here is a really cool discussion, because what the Spectre says is that once the Kansas wastelands were stripped of radiation, Superman's penitentiary was fast completed. The Gulag was built to imprison the deadliest and most uncontrollable of the superhumans. Thanks to its vast size, it was intended to house prisoners for months to come. Within two weeks of its construction, 
construction, it was filled beyond capacity. And what this illustrates here, and it's one of the most important things, what this illustrates here is to a degree how quickly Superman is falling. Now, a lot of this is coming off the heels of Wonder Woman. That's one of the things to keep in mind that while she's not a true villain in this story, the position of Wonder Woman is more of, as we said in the last video, when you're a hammer, everything is a nail. And so she doesn't really understand the nature of diplomacy. She does to a degree insofar as an ambassador from Themyscira to humanity can understand diplomacy, but there's a lot more to it. There's nuance. There's a much bigger scene going on here with regards to all these metahumans, which is like we mentioned before, they have no real leader. There's no quote unquote parent teaching them how to function in this world. Without Superman, this is what the world looks like when you have metahumans and no one likes Superman to inspire, guide, or lead them. Now, the other part of this is that in order for the prison to function effectively and actually house these people, the Justice League needed someone who was capable of building a prison that no one could escape from and could only do that by being someone that could escape from any prison. They basically enlisted Scott Free, Mr. Miracle. Now, we're not given a whole lot about him. For all you super hardcore Mr. Miracle fans, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> we don't get a whole lot about this guy. All we're really told is that he was the one that was instrumental in building the prison, building a place that no one could escape from because he's a master escape artist who can escape from anywhere. So if, if he can build a place no one can get out of, that means no one can get out of it. But the bigger issue that you have to contend with is that what Superman was trying to do was balance the humanity of metahumans with a prison system. And so what he ended up creating was this situation where you had all these people who were there, but they all kind of had free reign. They could sort of move around and they could do their thing. He didn't want them to feel like they were in some kind of like a concentration camp or something. That starts to present a lot of issues because what he does is he presents himself to these people as someone that can lead them into a better future. But the reality is the life they know is the only life they've known. They haven't known a life where there's been some greater force out there that can show them the way. All they've known is this vigilantism. So to them, that's the definitive life, right? It's one of those things. Those of you guys who are familiar with uh, the allegory of Plato's cave, that's what this is. Those of you guys who don't know what that is, the allegory of Plato's cave is this idea that if you had like three people who had basically spent their entire life in a cave and all they ever saw of the real world were shadows projected on the cave wall, to them, that is the real world, right? For us, we know that it's not real, but it is real to them. And so if you were to take them out of that cave and you were to show them the world as it really exists, they would reject it as incomprehensible because it just defies everything they know. And as we know as people, in times of desperation, people will believe what they want to believe. Logic and reason and emotion have no bearing on that. It's just whatever makes them feel the most comfortable. And what makes these people feel comfortable is the life that they've been living. Suddenly, this guy just comes out of nowhere, quite literally strips them of this life they had, throws them into what is in effect a prison system, and then says, I'm here to improve you. From their perspective, it's, but there's nothing wrong with me because they don't believe there's anything wrong with them. That's why he's met with so much hostility. And so what you have is this kind of fight that begins to break out to a degree, but it all is quelled pretty quickly. But it really is one of these things where Superman is in over his head. He's putting too much faith in those who cannot, who just cannot be trusted in that way, right? He's putting trust in people who have no reason to be trusted. He's trying to fix the broken who are beyond repair. And so that's what's kind of crazy is because while all this goes on, you have, of course, the, uh, the Mankind Liberation Front that's watching all of this unfold and coming to this realization that nothing that Superman is trying to achieve is actually going to work. He is fighting a fool's errand. Beyond that, what you also have is the Quintessence. Now, the Quintessence are basically a coming together of a cosmic forces, if you want to call them that. So think of the Quintessence as DC's equivalent to the, the Skyfathers, but on seemingly a higher level of power. Honestly, there's no direct translation between the Quintessence and the Skyfathers, but the Skyfathers that Marvel has is about the closest you get to this. But within the DC landscape, these are some heavy hitters. The Spectre, the Phantom Stranger, uh, the Wizard Shazam, you have Ganthet of the uh, of the Green Lantern or the Guardians of the, of the Universe. You have some heavy hitters here. They're kind of an inner council that basically monitors and watches things to see how the universe unfolds. Now, the funny situation about this is that as the Spectre is watching all this unfold, that you have the Quintessence that's just like, whatever happens on Earth, that's their problem, right? Earth is a single world, right? It's just a, a just tiny little ball of mud in an infinitely expanding universe. There's much bigger things and more important things that we need to worry about. And the Spectre asks the question, is that so? And when the answer or the response to the, uh, the Quintessence is yes, and he says, then why do you all spend so much time dealing with humanity? Why are you observing this for such a lengthy period of time? If humanity matters so little, you would give them no more of a thought than you would some comet streaming across the cosmos. But you're facing, like you're literally focusing on humanity. You're focusing on this whole thing. So on some base level, it's entirely possible that you 
you congregate in order to prevent each other from interfering. That each one of you wants to be involved in your own way. You, Ganthet, want to gather the Green Lantern Corps and send the Green Lantern Corps in to quell this entire thing. You, Phantom Stranger, want to do something else. Or you, the Wizard Shazam, want to step in in some capacity. But each of you have agreed to remain hands off. You care more than you're willing to admit. Now, a really important moment in this story comes when Norman McKay, watching all this unfold, really just can't understand, can't hear anything they're saying because I guess the conversation is not meant for him. That's really what he speculates. He's met by the arrival of Boston Brand. Now, Boston Brand being dead man, this is when we're starting to get into this idea of the, the religious and mythological side of DC Comics, right? For those of you guys who are new to DC, DC has two sides. You've got the front-facing superhero side. That's the face they present to the general public, anybody who wants to start getting into comics. That's your Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Justice League comics. Then you have the other side. You've got like the Vertigo side, the, the idea of mysticism, religion, God, Lucifer, all that kind of stuff, Boston Brand and everything, the Spectre. That's the other part. That's the mystical side, the religious side. Boston Brand, whenever you see him, usually in a story like this, he possesses somebody, not always. But the idea of Boston Brand is that he's well aware of the Spectre and the Phantom Stranger and this whole side of things. Norman McKay is not. And so where Norman McKay is basically a pastor who's devoted his life to the belief in God, basically the presence, that kind of a thing, showing up here and encountering all this, it is to a degree questioning his faith. And not to really be a terrible person about it, but Boston Brand kind of pushes him over a little bit further. Because what he basically tells him is that you have no idea what's really going on here in the greater world, do you? Like, you read your Bible to your congregation, you take the words that you see in the book with an absolute faith that up to this moment can never truly be shaken, you believe that it was true. But you never actually had the facts. You never really knew what was going on. Now, Norman McKay can't really be faulted for that because no one had taken him on a journey like this before. Nothing had ever happened in his life that led him to believe that while the book he was reading wasn't necessarily false, there was just more to the to the equation than he was seeing. But what Boston Brand says is, one, you're being taken on this ride by the Spectre, and it is important that you undergo this. But one thing to know, the Spectre, just because he's some being out there of divine nature, does not mean he's inherently good. It does not mean that that's the case. He's like, one of the things you need to understand is that when it comes to the notion of good and evil, that sure, you've got things like the presence and you've got Lucifer and all the stuff contained within your book. But the reality here is the, the situation as it exists, the real world, as it, you know, as if you could call it that, right, what passes for, you know, a lack of a better word here, it's anything but that. It's just varying shades of gray. Good and evil do not really exist out there. It's just whatever a person can do and can't do. So do not take everything the specter tells you as an absolute truth. He was bonded to Jim Corgan. He was a cop at one point in time when he was just the spirit of vengeance he went crazy, basically lost his mind, became what you would call evil for a while. The guy is not some genuine altruistic force out there designed to just punish the wicked on behalf of God. It's not that that black and white. It's not that binary. And so he says, take what he tells you, right? Listen to what he tells you and keep it in the back of your head. Just don't take it as an absolute truth. And then he basically walks away. Now, this particular moment with Boston Brand will become incredibly important once we get to the end of the story, because it'll totally change the way that Norman McKay handles things. But on the other side of the equation regarding the whole idea of the Mankind Liberation Front, one of the questions that I imagine a lot of you all have is, why is Billy Batson working with Lex Luthor? So the way this works is we're not really given a definitive answer here. We'll actually get that here in a little bit. It'll really be on behalf of Batman that explains it. The thing behind this, though, is that Billy Batson here as an adult is constantly showed footage of superheroes just being violent, how superheroes are quote-unquote inherently bad. Now, it's not really Lex Luthor cooking the books here. He's showing uh, Shazam actual footage. He's showing him these actual things that go on. The difference is that much like most things that exist here in the world on the media side, news and so on and so forth, he's only ever being given one half of the story to serve a particular purpose. The other part of this and what Lex, uh, Lex Luthor is doing is he's channeling the knowledge of Dr. Savannah, right? Mr. Mind. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that Kingdom Come is post-crisis on Infinite Earths, but before the New 52. So the New 52 origin of Mr. Mind and Dr. Savannah don't really apply here. Instead, going by the power of Shazam way back in the 1990s, in 1996, that the way this played out is that Mr. Mind had basically taken over Savannah and then planned like an invasion of Earth, right? That kind of thing. What we're not told here, but what seems to be the case is that with Mr. Mind being a sentient being that can operate by his own whim, his own will and desire and so on and so forth, that maybe something happens somehow Dr. Savannah managed to overpower Mr. Mind or whatever it is. But the idea of a telepathic worm was basically used here. We're not really given the details about how all this unfolded. All we know is using a worm to mentally control other individuals around him is how Lex Luthor's been controlling Shazam. So there's a lot of ambiguity there. But one of the things that does go on here is you do end up having Batman who's actually watching all this
this unfold using a secret spy device. Now, of course, what's also taking place here is working with the, the Mankind Liberation Front. They're basically weaponizing and creating a whole bunch of these mech bats, right? These, these bat robots that can be used to kind of operate in lieu of metahumans in order to keep society in check. Now, one of the things that Batman wanted to establish with Lex Luthor is that what they're looking for is to basically move the world in a better direction, right? To create world order, not world domination. They're not looking to subjugate humanity. They're looking to lead humanity in a better, uh, to a better future and believe they can only do that because they themselves are humans. That metahumans just can't relate to humanity in that way, right? Because they simply have a level of power that humanity doesn't possess, right? That at the end of the day, if mankind were to follow the will of God, it would be due more to fear than an actual love or belief in the power that person possesses. And so what you have here for the most part when it comes to uh, to Billy Batson walking around is he basically seems very inhuman in terms of his appearance. He smiles all the time and never really shows any emotion or anything like that. And so it really it really freaks people out. It creeps them out in a lot of ways. Like, why is this guy always smiling and looking like that? Right? He looks like a robot. Like, it's just kind of strange. And so what you also have going on here, and this is one of the more important things that we don't get a lot of, uh, a lot of exposition on, is Martian Manhunter. Because that's probably a question that a lot of people had. Where's Martian Manhunter in all of this? Now, what we end up finding out is that Martian Manhunter basically keeps himself under the guise as a regular guy. That you, that at least attempting to use the telepathy of Martian Manhunter is very, very limited here in order to keep anybody from knowing what he actually is. And the reason why is because this guy's mind is walking a knife's edge. That following Superman basically walking away, Martian Manhunter in what was probably the most terrible decision he could make had actually telepathically reached out to the whole of humanity and experiencing all of the nature of humanity at one point in time basically broke him, right? Humanity, like the very core of human beings broke Martian Manhunter. He never truly understood what humanity was about until he touched all their minds at the same time. And so because of that, where there's an attempt by Batman to utilize the powers of, uh, of Martian Manhunter to effectively read the minds of the people in the room to find out what their actual goals and motivations are, in the end, it simply just proves to be too much. And so Martian Manhunter just kind of goes about his business and that's seemingly the last we see of him for a while. But the thing about this is you do have this kind of moment in the, the Watchtower, or really the, I guess, the Citadel of the Green Lantern, where the Justice League watches everything. And for the most part, they've quelled most all of these metahuman threats that exist around the world just by arbitrary fighting and whatnot. Things have calmed down, right? Germany's clear, all these different locations. But the funny thing about this is that the Flash picks up on the presence of Norman McKay. And as a result of that, actually yanks Norman McKay out of this kind of invisible barrier, so to speak, because the reality is that with the Spectre, they had him slightly out of phase with the universe itself. But as the Flash, he can phase through dimension, so it was only a matter of time before he saw something that indicated Norman McKay was there. As soon as he picked up on it, Norman McKay's yanked out, he's subdued by Power Woman, and then questioned by Superman. And when he, when Superman asked the question, like, who are you and why are you here? The reality is that witnessing this guy's presence firsthand, actually meeting him firsthand, overwhelms Norman McKay. He doesn't quite know how to respond. He ends up turning into what's basically a babbling fool, all the way to the point that he starts basically running off biblical scripture, right? Just saying, like, well, the end times are coming and that kind of stuff. He sounds like a religious kook, babbling about how the, the how, how Armageddon is coming, the end of days is here, some crazy person that you would just walk by on the side of the road and pay no attention to. And that's kind of what Superman does. They basically dismiss him because the well, while this is going on, you have Dick Grayson as Robin who chimes in and says like, there's a riot in the gulag, right? Like we have to get to the gulag, we have to respond. And of course, Wonder Woman steps in and basically tells everybody what they need to do and sends them out there. And then a great big huge debate takes place between Wonder Woman and Superman Superman, when he asked the question, why did you override my authority? Right? Why did you undermine me? And the, the response of her is, why did I do that? I saw a crisis. I reacted in a confident and unequaled manner. The others need to see that sort of authority from someone. Pull yourself together. We're overdue for a meeting with the United Nations. They can't help but know about the gulag by now. And the response of Superman is, then I guarantee they're wondering when we started making up our own laws. Let's go. And in meeting with the United Nations, basically the overall gist of this conversation is humanity is losing faith in the metahumans. They're losing faith in Superman's ability to keep this entire threat under control. Because where Superman responded by saying, I can corral them in, I can get this whole thing sorted out. The reality here is he's losing control. That the Gulag was created as a prison. He did what was probably the worst possible thing, which is take all these people with all this power and put them into one single location. It's a melting pot of just anger and rage and madness. That's literally what it is. Tempers running high, the whole nine yards. You've got villains who are now being housed with heroes because that's kind of how they see themselves to a degree. They, all they do, all they know how to do is just fight. And so because that's all they know how to do when it comes to solving their problems, any disagreement 
that, that arises between these different metahumans is met with conflict. They don't understand the idea of diplomacy or talking things down or having a conversation or any of that stuff. They don't know there's a better way. While that whole thing goes down with regards to this crisis in the Gulag, you do have the, uh, the, the Mankind Liberation Front that finally decides it's the time to make their move. It's their time to decide what it is that they're going to do, right? How they're going to act here. Now, you do have Lex Luthor who effectively grabs Shazam and says, now's the chance, right? Now's your time to deal with this. And when that happens, Batman incapacitates Lex Luthor. And that's when we end up finding out that's why Batman was here in the first place. That he never really joined the, the Mankind Liberation Front, never really even believed in their movement in the first place. What he wanted to know is what happened with Billy Batson. What's going on with Shazam? Because the reality here is that Shazam is probably the only guy out there that can go toe to toe with Superman. And in fact, that's going to be a major component of this story when we get to part four, Superman versus Shazam. But it's a really cool thing because what we end up getting is this explanation where Batman had figured it out. And he says, I'd suspected for a while and John Jones telepathic probe confirmed it. It seems Marvel's dual identities are in quite a bit of mental conflict. All these years, as Batson grew to manhood, Luther kept him in check by turning him into a stew of schizophrenic psychosis. And he says, my only goal in allying with you was to learn your connection to Captain Marvel. In the entire global conflict, he was the wild card. And I hate wild cards. And so that's the crazy thing here is because now we know that when Billy Batson was a little kid and Superman had basically walked away, that, that, that essentially Lex Luthor took Billy Batson under his wing and then using basically telepathic worms, the knowledge of Mr. Mind or of Dr. Savannah, had been keeping Billy Batson under his thrall, under his control. The problem here is you have Batman who tells his guys, take out the Mankind Liberation Front, right? Deal with those guys. And at the same time, you also have Billy Batson who basically races off under the orders of Lex Luthor to find Superman and to deal with him. But again, Billy Batson is still under the control of Lex Luthor. But that's the concern that you have when it comes to Batman is because when he confronts uh, Shazam, when he finally in, you know encounters him and you've got all these tubes that are filled with all these worms that Lex Luthor has been using on Shazam and they all start to kind of infiltrate Billy Batson, he finally shouts the word Shazam and becomes a superhero self and then takes off at the direction of Lex Luthor to find Superman. So that's the big issue is what happens when these two meet? How is it all going to go down? And so where you have Wonder Woman and you have Superman who arrive back at the, uh, at the, the, Watchtower, I guess we can just start calling it that, right? Like the Emerald Citadel, the Justice League Watchtower is effectively what it is. A great big, huge argument breaks out between the two because what you have here is this, this point where Superman says, yet another side of you that I'm not comfortable with, right? This part of you that's willing to do whatever it takes to win. And the response of her is, get used to this one. A soldier unprepared has no business calling herself a soldier. And the response of Superman is, you know, quote unquote, more Amazonian wisdom, right? Isn't it possible that we've already won the big fight? Once the rioters are calmed, we can instead still some measure of peace. And the response of Wonder Woman is, you always were a bit vulnerable to magic because Superman cut himself on her sword. Be careful, the sword was a gift from Hephaestus. It can carve the electrons off an atom. And, and the question of Superman is, did you expect to use that on me? And she says, I expected to be a soldier, right? So what this indicates is that if it came down to it, Wonder Woman was willing to kill Superman. She was willing to take him out, that the sword was effectively a backup plan. And he says, I will not sanction lethal force against me or any of the riots. I'm uneasy with that blade because that's the other part of the equation. Sure, it can be used on Superman if it needs to be, but she's willing to kill those metahumans. Superman is not. And that's the discussion that we had in the previous video. In any particular conflict, wartime, video games, sports, whatever it is, right? They're all forms of conflict. There's only ever two people involved or two types of people involved at any particular point in time. The ones who would like to win and the ones who want to win, who need to win. And the ones who would like to win are not usually the ones who win because the ones who feel like they need to win or have to win, they'll do whatever it takes. The only thing that matters is that they come out on top. Superman is by all standards of measurement what you would call a high road defeatist. He's a person that takes the stance of saying, I would rather die and keep my morals intact, right? I would rather lose and keep my morals than win by betraying them. But the reality here is of what use would that do to anybody, right? If the one who loses and keeps their morals intact, if they die, if they're out of the picture now, all that's left is the one who wins and 
doing whatever it is that they want to do. There's no one there to stand in the way. So in effect, they've quit. They're a defeatist. They gave up, right? Literally maintaining their moral code is what caused them to lose in the first place. And that's the real position here. Wonder Woman is the one that has to win, that needs to win. She's the one that's willing to beg, borrow, steal, and kill. For Superman, it's a war of convenience. And that's why you see this conflict unfolding the way that it is. Because he says, there are lines that we do not cross. We have rules. And her stance is, and the prisoners don't. That's why they're prisoners. And if they don't remain prisoners, your big blue marble teeters on the brink. You made the decision to incarcerate them for the good of mankind, remember? And he says, and maybe that was my mistake. Maybe I should have let the humans decide how to deal with this. But at the end of the day, it was Superman's screw up that what he failed to realize is that he's basically fighting a war against people who don't follow the rules while following the rules himself. And that desire to follow the rules is how you lose. That's his weakness. And so as this whole thing, all whole thing unfolds, you end up having this communication that comes from the Green Lantern who's like, we can't hold this, right? These guys are just way too powerful for us. There's too many of them. They're overpowering us. They're breaching the walls. We cannot keep this thing contained. Somebody has to do something. And we end up finding out that one of the people that one of the superheroes had been killed, Captain Comet had died. So now members of the Justice League are dying because of Superman's high road defeatist attitude. And so what this does is it leads to Wonder Woman stepping in and saying, then we're going to go there and we're going to do whatever we have to do. If that means we have to kill every single metahuman that's housed in the gulag, we'll kill every single one. Either you can stay back here and you can hope that things work out, or you can join us in this conflict. You can grow some balls and you can make the decisions that need to be made because this is a time of war. Are you a winner or are you a loser? Choose one. And ultimately Superman stays behind. And so that's one of the crazy things is because in this moment, he races off actually where Wonder Woman takes off to the gulag. He races off to Batman and confronts him and says, I need your help. And where Batman's like, no, we've been through that already. Superman fed up is like, I've had enough of this, right? This is not the time for you to take some kind of high road or be a dick or anything like that, right? This, this There are huge stakes here. We literally have metahumans breaking out of this. The United Nations is waiting on pins and needles to decide what it is that they're going to do. And if it comes down to it, they're going to go to the nuclear option. So they could very well just wipe us all out as metahumans. The entirety of our future hinges on this. It hinges on this whole thing. And the response of Batman is, what did you think was going to happen? You took every single metahuman that you deemed to be a bad guy and put them in one place. You took a huge group of people, tons of people who don't know how to solve any problem other than fighting over it, and you put them in one place and gave them free reign. You created this circumstance. You set this whole thing up. You're the reason why this is happening in the first place. And he even says, like, do you mean to tell me, Superman, that you, you, you mean to tell me you never imagined that it might come to this? Did you ever consider that war might actually be for the best? That perhaps humanity's only chance is for the superhumans to swallow each other, right? To basically annihilate each other. It's the best chance humanity has of any, uh, of having any kind of meaningful future. And this debate back and forth rages in such a way to where it's like either you can do something super or a Batman or you can do nothing because lest we forget you're a member of the Justice League. And so before you take this high stance of it is humanity's chance, right? It's time for superhumans to go. You were along with us. You're the smartest man in the world. Maybe depending on Lex Luthor, do you really think they're not going to come after you? Do you really think they're going to say, well, all the metahumans have to go. And by metahumans, we mean anybody who has powers. Batman's cool. Do you really think that's what they're going to say? No, they're going to come after you because you have the ability to affect the world on a global scale. Maybe not with powers, but certainly with your intelligence. You represent a clear and present danger. And then the response of, of Batman here is like, okay, fine. And he says, I will tell you this one thing. I'm not going to help you in all of this, but I will tell you this one thing. There's a player that you have not counted on, and that's Marvel. That's literally Captain Marvel, Billy Batson. And Superman's taken aback, and he says he's been brainwashed severely. Once there was a good kid inside him, but he's basically been driven out. And I don't know how you'd ever find him again. He's lost, right? Billy Batson is headed to the Gulag. He's going to break it wide open onto the Justice League. He's literally going to unleash all the superheroes out there, and he's going to initiate a circumstance where humanity is going to respond with nuclear arms. Arms. And when that happens, it's game over, right? Like it's that's it. There's no coming back. You all get nuked. Maybe some of you survive, but ultimately the entirety of the human race will see you as the reason why it happened. And so ultimately you end up having Shazam who arrives on the scene. Superman gets there just in time, right? Tries to get there just, just before it happens, but he's too late. Shazam smashes the place open right as Superman gets there. And then before he can do anything, Shazam stops him dead in his tracks.
All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and after four days, we are here. Yes, we are here at the conclusion of Kingdom Come. Yes, I'm gonna be on a cruise by the time this video comes out. So uh, I'll see y'all in like a week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be getting tanned, I'm gonna be getting drunk, I'm gonna be having a great time hanging out with my sister, right? She and I, we love taking trips together. So here's what we're gonna do, right? Here's here's how this whole thing works. This video is basically the end of it all, right? The battle, the huge conflict that happens. Now, this is literally everybody against everybody to some degree. The reality here is that much like the various vigilantes that they fought to overcome, Superman, Shazam, Batman, Wonder Woman, all of them, there really aren't any good guys or bad guys anymore. It's really just descended into superheroes fighting superheroes. That's really all it is. Because a lot of old wounds are coming back out now, right? A lot of injuries are coming back out. A lot of anger, a lot of disdain, a lot of hurt is coming back to the surface. And that's what's happening here. We get this really, really cool statement that's offered where it said, is that the only reason I'm here? Of course, Norman McKay talking to the specter and he says, to watch some hideous judgment. Superman and I share the same terror. His face is a mask of confusion. He cannot comprehend how things came to this. Once upon a time, Captain Marvel was one of its mightiest allies. Now, whichever wisdom he once possessed has been dulled by Luther's brainwashing, making the captain a soldier of chaos, the one warrior who can counter Superman's every move and prevent him from continuing containing this battle. Superman believes himself to be the only force on earth powerful enough to end the superhuman war. He is wrong. And the reason why is because we transition to the United Nations where a meeting is being undertaken and you have all these world leaders who are saying this multi-megaton nuclear explosion held in reserve for just this moment. That he says, take a look at mankind's last hope, capable of vaporizing a country, sheathed in a force field, unbreachable by all cataloged metahuman human powers, a deployment system that's virtually undetectable, that essentially they've been waiting for something like this to happen. And when this thing goes off, there will be casualties, there will be civilians who will die. But the reality and what humanity is arguing here, what this guy's presenting is he's saying, listen to me and understand, there is nothing rational about dispatching tactical nukes into the heart of our own country. But these are not rational times. We are at the flashpoint of human existence. My God, you can hear the battle even here. At any moment, it threatens to spread forth and engulf the world. What then? What do we do in that circumstance? And he says, the only way to ensure that future generations remember this as humanity's final option is to ensure that there will be future generations after today. Let us strike while we still can, Godspeed. And the response is the United Nations fires off these, uh, these jets containing tactical nukes. And so jumping back to this major conflict, again, it's all heroes fighting heroes. And even Norman McKay says that. He says, even in the brightest day, the dust of the battle eclipses the sun itself. The prisoners released by Marvel's Thunderbolts strike out blindly. Wonder Woman's troops return force in kind. Both sides fight with reckless abandon. Whatever heroic moors of combat might once have ruled them becomes nostalgic memories. This is not a fight that will eventually die down. This is a forest fire that's just begun. A war that may well end the world. Any instant now, there will be fatalities and no way to turn back. With Superman deadlocked, their only prayer of deliverance rests with a force from on high. And this is the arrival of Batman along with his entire team. And he says, Batman's legion soars in like a silent cavalry. Man or machine, each agent knows his mission. Stem the loss of life. Prevent the riot while there's still time to exert control. The sheer force of Batman's presence kindles a desperate ember of hope, too late. Right, like there's nothing that Batman's presence can do to calm everybody down. He does what he can, where he can, but in the end, the arrival of Batman is not changing the tide. To make things even more difficult, an argument and then eventually a fight erupts between him and Wonder Woman where he tells her, this whole thing that you have, this idea of killing these metahumans, you're no different than those crazy metahumans themselves, right? Those fanatics, the vigilantes who just believe or who don't really care about collateral damage. You've become the very thing that you swore to fight against. Right, this idea of spreading love and understanding, but don't be afraid to bloody your knuckles doing it. He says, at the end of the day, what you're what you're doing here, everything that you're doing here, is not going to win you back your position with the Amazonians. You're overcompensating, and in your overcompensation, you're leading to the ending of everything. Now, Wonder Woman fires back and is like, why in the world do you believe you have any right to condemn me after all these years of you just 
vanishing from the entirety of the landscape. We could have used you after Superman left. We needed you and you were nowhere to be found. Superman abandoned us and so did you at a time when we actually needed you the most. You could have been our liaison to the rest of humanity, our eyes and ears. You could have spoken truth to lies. You could have been this person, but instead you weren't. But you cowered in your bat cave, turning your entire city into a, some kind of a dictatorship, ruling it with an iron fist. Who are you to tell me the problem with operating like some kind of a dictator? After all this time, your hypocrisy still knows no bounds. And in this giant fight between the two of them, suddenly, something catches Batman's attention. And that's when he sees these drones, these jets flying towards their conflict with nuclear bombs. And that's when he switched over to the fight between Superman and Shazam. And it's just this really amazing fight, right? Because the entire time Shazam is not holding back. And that's one of the big differences between the two that in the various conflicts they've had over the years by whatever manner and whatever means that Billy Batson was always the moral compass, right? He always held back because he was never really aiming to kill. That's not the case here, right? Under the mind control of Lex Luthor, his job is to kill Superman. That's his purpose here. So there's no real holding back here. That's why he keeps yelling Shazam. That's why he just keeps like just hitting Superman with all this energy. And that's why Superman is quite literally dying in this fight. And in a lot of ways, people see it happen, but they're so caught up with their own battles that they actually end up missing the fact that Superman is being killed by Shazam. And so switching back to Wonder Woman and Batman, Batman says, open your eyes, Diana, right? Your answer flies on metal wings. Those are nuclear carriers, the ultimate war bringers. Our war is not one of one act of violence at the cost of some lives, our war ends in extinction. If you're that devoted to the Amazon honor, if your soul genuinely longs for atonement on Amazonian terms, then let's keep fighting and let the planes do their work. And the response of Wonder Woman is no. And she ultimately stands down and the two of them end up going after these drones. The problem here is that as Norman McKay is watching this, he says, despite my spectral form, I feel the heat of Batman's lasers. I feel the strain of Titanic muscles and I hear the whisper of a pilot begging for forgiveness because they missed one and one of the bombs comes falling down to its destination. They couldn't get to it in time. And so what happens is you end up having Superman who just seizes Shazam, right? Just grabs his mouth and Billy Batson turns back into his human form. And Norman McKay says, for one frozen instant, the storm clears. Fingers that can fuse coal into diamond crawl across human bone. And in the hush of ears that can hear a cell divide, pick out with chilling ease the scream of human rage. A wave of x-rays confirms the bomb's potency, a telescopic glance calculates the seconds before impact he has to act now and that's when specter says it is time right judgment has come norman mckay the hour tolls our entire journey has brought us to this moment and he says judge and judge wisely that the Spectre needs a human host, and he puts the responsibility on Norman McKay and says, you have witnessed all of this. You've seen all of this unfold, Norman McKay. Judge, who will be condemned in this? Will it be humanity that will end, or will it be will it be the metahumans that will end? What will happen here? And so it's this really, really just beautiful and amazing moment because we're told Superman's palm spasms around Batson's jaw and Batson whimpers. The clock is racing, only moments remain before the blast. And Superman says, listen to me, Billy. Listen Listen harder than you have ever listened before. And he says, look around us. Look at what we've come to. There's a bomb falling. Either it kills us or we run rampant across the globe. I can still stop the bomb, Billy. That much I'm sure of. What I don't know is whether I should be allowed to. Superhumans or mankind, one will pay the ultimate price. And that decision, Billy Batson, is not for me to make. I am not a god. I am not a man. But you, Billy, you're both. And so he says, more than anyone who has ever existed, you know what it's like to live in both worlds. Only you can weigh their worth equally. Fight the brainwashing, Billy. You can let me go. Or with a word, you can stop me. Do you understand the choice that can be made by you alone? And Norma McKay chimes in and says, the tears of Billy Batson answer this question for Superman. And Superman says, then decide decide the world. And ultimately, Superman takes off. And in the moment when Superman leaves, Billy Batson yells, Shazam! And the Seven Thunders come crashing down. Billy turns back into Shazam again, grabs Superman, smashes him into the ground, and goes flying up to the bomb. Now, it's one of these crazy moments, because when this happens, everybody stops fighting. Like, everybody stops, and they're just watching Shazam as he's racing up to this nuclear bomb that's going to annihilate them all. He shouts Shazam three times. The bomb goes off off 
and Billy Batson dies. Like literally he sacrifices himself to save every superhero here. And all the Spectre says is judgment, right? This just super iconic scene of Superman on his knees screaming. If you ever saw that shot, that's where that's from. It's from Kingdom Come. And he's just surrounded by dead bodies. That's it. When he gets up, Superman is eight kinds of pissed. This guy is incensed. And ultimately the Spectre's like, I've done my job, right? judgment has been has been passed it's time for me to go he literally bids norman mckay farewell and norman's like no you're not going anywhere right like you're bound to me right like you're literally your spirit is bound to me if only in the moment if you really believe that letting superman just race off and whatever happens next is just you know it's whatever that's what's truly evil because all i saw here was bedlam and tragedy sadness right just a man who made a series of bad decisions and led everything to this if you leave now then that really is an evil thing. And so ultimately we end up following them to the United Nations where Superman's going. And this guy starts to unleash holy hell. I mean, just like starts to rip down the ceiling, right? He's gonna kill everybody here. He's gonna kill every single person here. And the specter says after 10 years, Superman has finally let free a wrath that would cower Satan himself. How can any man possibly calm the fury that he feels towards his prosecutors? And that's when Norman McKay steps up and he says, Clark, don't do this, right? You blame yourself for Captain Marvel, for Magog and Kansas for 10 years that ended today. Yes, you're angry, but in that anger, you're forgetting once more what humans feel. This is what humanity has been feeling for a long time. Humanity didn't just fire off these rockets at you to annihilate you because you just pissed them off one last time. It's because all they've known since your emergence, the emergence of metahumans is fear. They might follow you, they might smile at you, but at the end of the day, in their heart of hearts, they're scared of you because you tower above them. You fly above them, you spend your time above them. They never really see you exist in a watchtower that literally orbits the world, right? Like you are always in a state above them. All they know is fear. You are an omnipresent reminder that they are not you and how easy it would be for you to destroy them. And that's when Superman asks, who are you and why are you here? And Norman says, listen to me, Clark. He says, of all the things that you can do, all of your powers, the greatest has always been your instinctive knowledge of right and wrong. It was a gift of your own humanity. You never had to question your choices. In any situation, any crisis, you always knew what to do. But the minute that you made the super more important than the man, the day you decided to turn your back on mankind, that completely cost you your instinct. That took your judgment away. And he says, take it back. If you want redemption, Clark, it lies in the very next decision that you make. Make it as a man and make it right. And so ultimately, when he's met by the arrival of all these survivors, he's shocked by it all. He's like, how did anybody survive? And we're basically told that between the Flash and between Green Lantern and what have you, that basically some heroes were protected or some metahumans were protected. The big concern though is that humanity still has the same level of distrust. Like Magog is among these people who has survived, right? There's still the same level of distrust trust the same everything right and the question of wonder woman is what do we do now right like what do we do now clark it's still the same thing like we're still super like there's less of us but we're still metahumans right there's still those individuals out there who believe that that fighting is the only way to solve problems and to a degree that's true right violence is not always the answer but it is a answer and it's usually a very effective one and the response to superman is years ago i let those that i swore to protect drive me away we all did and that was the day all of this began and and these people say like we saw you as gods and superman says so did we we saw ourselves as gods too who could somehow lead you into a better place but that's not what you need that's not what humanity needed humanity did not need to be a horse that we strapped a, a rope to and led to water what humanity needed was someone to show them how to get there what you needed was for us to live among you, to be a part of you, but not to be above you. And that will change. From this point going forward, we will no longer operate above all of you. We will work alongside you. We will work with you. We will help you make the world a better place. We will offer our wisdom and our guidance from our own experiences. We will bring that to the table. I can bring you wisdom and guidance from a long dead civilization that's that was vastly more, more advanced than yours was at the time that it expired. Batman is the most intelligent person Person in the world. Wonder Woman has the experience and wisdom of quite literally gods. 
<laughs> we can bring all of this to the table and we can help make you better. And we're going to do this by also using the wisdom of a man who left his legacy on the world by sacrificing his life of Billy Batson. And they actually end up using the cape of Billy Batson as one of the flags at the United Nations. And so what you get is this sort of epilogue where you end up finding out that Wayne Manor has basically been rebuilt. It's been turned into a hospital to treat those who survived the entirety of the super of the metahuman conflict, but it'll also serve as basically a way to kind of keep those detained. Uh, Lex Luthor's one of those. <laughs> Superman, of course, is recovering. He's accompanied by Wonder Woman, who's also probably offering her own methods of recovery for Superman, if you know what I mean. But you also have Wonder Woman regaining her ranks among the Amazonians, right? Having basically ushered the world into a better place. What you get in the aftermath of this metahuman conflict is really a, a utopia. You get an entire utopia here. And it's a wonderful and a beautiful thing because a lot of these graves are built in remembrance of those individuals who died. And Clark Kent actually starts working to, to set Kansas back to a place where it can be, it can go back to being the breadbasket, right? It can go back to growing crops and different things along those lines. They lead the world into a much better place, into a utopia that they always wanted it to be. And that right there is the value of violence. Had this entire metahuman conflict never taken place in the, in the first place, would this future ever have come to fruition? Would it have ever happened? And the answer is most likely no. If Superman had stayed hands off, if he had remained in his fortress and never gotten involved, you likely would have seen some kind of a nuclear response by humanity and the world would have just been plunged into chaos. Those metahumans who did survive would have annihilated what remained of humanity and they would have taken the world for themselves. And that would have been the end of it, right? That what it took was a massive conflict. It took death and destruction on that scale in order to force the change of both humanity and metahumans because it's only in the Face of such tragic loss that we're actually forced to confront what caused that loss in the first place. In that moment, we're caught up. We're all emotionally swept up with everything that's going on, right? That's exactly what happened here. Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Humanity, Lex Luthor, so on and so forth. They were so caught up in the situation that no one ever stopped to take a step back and ask the question, how did we get here? What led us to this point? It was only when humanity or when the metahumans were facing their own extinction at the hands of a new nuclear arsenal and that near extinction came to fruition had it not been for Billy Batson. Had, if that bomb had detonated at ground zero, they all would have been killed. Likely Superman too. I don't know if that would have been the case, but presumably it would have been. Maybe he would have survived. I don't know. But the thing is, most of the entire metahuman population would have been destroyed, right? Like it was only in the face of their own extinction and annihilation that they were finally able to, to peel, black, peel back this, this cloak, right? This blanket of destruction and death and despair and come to terms with what they'd done and the fact that Superman himself had led the human... Uh, the metahuman community on this collision course. It was his actions that led things to getting where they were. And so everything is really kind of settling back down. Norman McKay finds his own measure of hope, reaffirms his conviction in God, goes back to reading the Bible and his congregation grows. It's that kind of thing that serves a greater purpose. What's really cool is like the specter as Jim Corgan shows up to listen to his sermon at one point in time. That's the beauty of it all. And so of course, for the first time in the story, you have uh, Superman and you've got uh, Wonder Woman who basically show up to Planet Krypton, where they sit down and they basically realize everybody's dressed up as superheroes. Not gonna lie, I would go to this place. If this place existed in the real world, I don't know if it does, and if it does exist, I will go to wherever I need to be in order to be able to go there. But I would absolutely go to this place, 100%. And in fact, you know what? Like, if this is something that's like at a major comic book convention, right, of like, they do this at San Diego Comic-Con, we should all go, right? I mean, I don't know if, you know, one or two point, what is it? 2.13, 2, 2, uh, 130,000 people can fit in there, but uh, we'll try. So like, I, I would love, <laughs> <laughs> I would love like to go to a place like this. It just looks amazing. But at the end of the day, it's really the three of them just kind of sitting down and having this conversation and really just being a part of humanity. Not really above them, not really beyond them, not operating outside of them, but basically being among them and just kind of enjoying their life among people. Having this conversation, talking about everything that's going on, right? That, you know, Batman in, in having this conversation says that it's been a long road for rehabilitation for the for all the injured. He says, fortunately, I I'm not laboring alone. I was able to put several members of the Mankind Liberation Front to work in our ad hoc hospital. And when he says he put them to work, he means like slap collars around their necks and 
made them work, which rightfully they deserved. He says they're pulling their weight. Vandal Savage alone has picked up quite a few healing tricks in his 50,000 years. That that's really them just kind of talking about everything that's happening, having this conversation. And what's really, really cool is you end up finding out that uh, Wonder Woman and Superman, they kind of got something going on, right? That Batman's a little pissed off because the stake is well done, which I, you know, you know what? I can't even judge him for that. Whatever, man. But you have this moment where like Wonder Woman and, and Batman or Superman are like, hey, we kind of have something to share. And Batman's like, yeah, you're pregnant. I already know. Like, I know you're pregnant, Wonder Woman, right? So like Superman knocked up Wonder Woman, making a life for himself. That's really what's going on here. It's just, just kind of going forward, right? They want Batman to be the godfather, which I don't know why anybody would ask that, right? I would never ask Batman to be the godfather of my child ever. Well, there would be, there would, okay, I'm, I'll take that back. There would be rules. I would be like, he has to be a Robin at least once. He has to be set up financially for the rest of his life or her life or whatever. They have to be able to drive the Batmobile at least one time. Like they have to be able to take the Batmobile to prom. That's, that's like a rule, right? Like, I mean, I don't know how I would reinforce that. I'd be dead if Batman was like, if it came to that, right? I would have been dead, hence the nature of a godfather. But I'd be like, you have to let my child take the Batmobile to prom. Because how dope would that be? You'd be walking away with other people's prom dates. You know, but nonetheless, it's just one of those things, right? You gotta take, you gotta have the Batmobile. Taking the Batmobile to prom would be legit. But again, kind of being more serious here, right? Getting back down to, to a serious tone and talking about all this, it really is everything coming to a close, right? That this world has achieved a level of peace and a level of, of understanding and really a utopia that was previously never thought possible. All it took was the near extinction of the entirety of the metahuman race coming from a decision that humanity didn't want to make in order for it to happen. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. This was the story of Kingdom Come. Absolutely loved it. Let me know what you guys think about it, and I will catch you all later. Peace.